uh, in the past uh, uh, few lectures on photonic materials we have looked more at uh, uh, the possibility of organic photonics where organic molecules can be used for um, opto electronic applications especially we have seen uh, the examples of how organic molecules both small molecule and uh, organic polymers how they can be used for uh, device applications as OLED displays and also uh, in another lecture we have seen the uh, <coughs> importance of uh, organic molecules in solar cells. Today I am going to talk to you about uh, a group of inorganic compounds which is actually holding uh, a billion dollar industry for more than 20 years now and uh, they are generally categorized as uh, phosphor materials and uh, as you would see uh, in the cartoons uh, in this slide, uh, there are variety of applications that you can engineer using this set of uh, molecules uh, or inorganic compounds. Uh, they are usually uh, oxides or sulphides. So, uh, in this lecture I will try to outline the importance of this uh, molecule, uh, molecules or oxides and then uh, how this uh, is go governing uh, the principle of tuning colors in uh, uh, display devices. <coughs> Let me start first with uh, what this phosphor history is all about and where it emerged from. Uh, it actually started as early as 1603. Uh, we have documents where an uh, Italian scientist is alchemist actually. He found that uh, barite which is nothing but barium sulphate when it is heated with coal um, on heating he observed a bluish glow which is actually due to barium sulphide which formed. So, since then there has been several revisitation of this issue of glowing materials. 1866 first stable zinc sulphide phosphor was described and then calcium sulphide was discovered in 1870 and 1885 87 the concept of bioluminescence from fireflies was also observed. So, these are some of the milestones in this phosphor research and uh, in the last 20 30 years it has taken a very different uh, turn and we can look at it. Uh, before I define what this phosphor materials are and where we, we can see them operating. Uh, just give you a basic definition of the different types of luminescent uh, phosphors that are possible. Uh, when we say luminescence it means we are talking about light emission and this can actually come from two processes which are fundamental to uh, photochemistry and they, those are called as fluorescence and phosphorescence. Fluorescence uh, is a fast decaying process and the decay of this uh, excited molecules happens in the order of 10 power minus 15 seconds. Therefore, there is no after glow it just rapidly quenches. Then you have a spin forbidden transition um, which is called as phosphorescence and this is because of its spin forbidden nature it is a slow emission process therefore, we can call this as a strong after glow. And in both categories we also have a subsets of uh, this process manifested. One is phosphoros phosphorescence which is excited by light, uh, cathodophosphorescence when it is excited by electrons, electrophosphorescence when it is excited by current. Same is true for fluorescence, you have uh, electrofluorescence, cathodofluorescence and uh, <coughs> photofluorescence. So, um, as you would see here the category of light emission actually comes from what is the initiating process and uh, the case of uh, phosphors with the either cathodophosphorescence or cathodofluorescence is a well established one out of all these uh, uh, possibilities and uh, this is basic to the uh, CRT uh, tube applications which I will come uh, in the next few slides. Uh, so, when we talk about luminescent materials um, we should also know that how much ever we engineer the uh, 
uh, mother nature has also gifted uh, many uh, luminescent materials which are found as it is without even any refining process you can isolate those um, <coughs> luminescent materials in nature. For example, calcite itself is uh, a blue light emitting one if you can uh, excite it with the long, U, long wave UV. So, this is a calcite uh, crystal which is glowing under UV radiation and zircon is uh, here and that shows a dominating yellow and then you have uh, eucryphite which is mainly a, a europium doped uh, phosphor and then uh, wilmenite is there. Uh, then we also have a combination of several of these phosphors um, which is available in nature as it is as wilmenite, uh, calcite, franklin all these are uh, isolated as minerals. So, uh, as you would see here under uh, UV radiation uh, several lights with very strong fluorescence can be obtained, uh, but uh, this should also respond to cathodo uh, luminescence. Some of these materials may not be an active material for uh, the process uh, by which it is driven either by current or by cathode rays or by photo. So, depending on the nature of application these materials can find uh, use uh, in devices uh, and again this is the example of bioluminescence where the firefly actually is actu glowing. Uh, this is the firefly uh, without uh, illuminating uh, um, the light, but when it is actually luminescing it glows like this and the, the basic compound that is uh, responsible for this chemiluminescence or bioluminescence is this compound luciferin uh, which emits in dark and uh, the basic uh, functional groups here are thiazole groups which becomes very important and uh, uh, to isolate this compound uh, it is a billion dollar work. Uh, in fact, uh, if you see in commercial catalogs you would uh, see one uh, microgram sold for 100 dollars. So, to isolate these compounds are very expensive therefore, although it is very highly luminescing with very good quantum efficiency these molecules have not been uh, used per se, but apart from the naturally occurring luminescent materials we also have man made materials and uh, you can see all these signboards and uh, um, different uh, um, ceramic components glowing in the dark mainly because of a variety of um, compounds that you can prepare and uh, in the UV light they uh, show uh, the same color and in, in darkness uh, you can see that they are glowing and uh, it is also possible for us to uh, generate white light emitting uh, phosphors by combination of these colors. So, these are man made phosphors and uh, this can also find use uh, in device applications and here is another example of how glow in the dark phosphors can be seen. Now, uh, just to satisfy our curiosity I would like to list some of the uh, afterglow phosphors which uh, show phosphorescence um, during their emission and some of the candidates are the yttrium uh, oxide uh, doped with uh, sulfur and as you would see this is nothing but Y2O3 one of the oxygen is replaced fully by sulfur and then the um, dopants here are europium, magnesium or titanium which will actually generate the uh, excited states uh, that will be responsible for uh, the phosphorescence here. And uh, one thing that I would like to draw your attention is to the visible uh, afterglow time in this phosphorus you can see they, they can radiate light for over 15 hours um, and uh, that is the speciality of this uh, sort of phosphorus. And um, if you can see uh, the other phosphorus they are all mostly alumina based. 
Okay, so, it is mostly yttrium based oxides or it is alumina based oxides and uh, these oxides are usually termed as SAM uh, if it is strontium aluminum uh, magnesium oxide or uh, BAM oxides. So, uh, depending on the constituents they have uh, they form a different story in terms of its uh, light output as you would see calcium aluminate with uh, europium is very selective for purplish blue, strontium aluminates for blue and bluish green and then strontium aluminate um, uh, simp the lower analog with europium is uh, specially meant for green fluorescence. And uh, as you would see here red and uh, yellow is mostly to do with yttrium based phosphorus. And, uh, these uh, phosphor materials uh, are mainly used in phosphor lamps uh, and today uh, the late uh, the latest generation um, lights uh, or bulbs are the CFL ones um, which has a very strong coating of this fluorescence and as you would see um, these oxides have a variety of applications and we will specifically look into phosphors which are used in TV uh, screen. Uh, so, what are these phosphors? Um, uh, these uh, phosphors are an established materials technology compared to liquid crystals and uh, other light emitting polymers and uh, they have been used in the cathode ray tube displays for around 100 years now. Uh, these phosphors are also used in avionic tube applications and uh, avionic displays and nothing but all the screens that you see in a cockpit is all totally driven by the CRT tubes and those CRT tubes are usually 6 inch um, uh, display stuff. So, all these avionic applications are totally taken over by this uh, CRT phosphors. Now, New research have actually focused on field emission displays and on photoluminescent LCDs which are already coming into market and uh, the phosphorus find a special role in that. When you look at the CRT tube, now you would wonder where exactly this phosphorus come into picture, but actually the phosphorus are the lightest part of the screen as somebody put it because the panel that you are facing which is the glass panel is actually containing phosphors in a very very small units as triads. I will show the contour of how these phosphors are coated on the phosphorus uh, on the glass screen and this is a very very well established uh, uh, technology now. Uh, this technology cannot be substituted. Uh, by even the nanotechnology that we are talking about because the sheer temptation for us would be to immediately try to make this phosphorus in nano scale, but uh, this particular technology is well proven not for nano, but for a micron technology. As I would point out in other slides, uh, you would be convinced that CRT phosphor does not necessarily need a nano phosphor but you can actually operate with the micron sized phosphor materials. So, uh, in the CRT tube the main uh, display uh, event that is happening is the light that is coming out apart from all the engineering technology that is there and uh, the lightest part is nothing but the screen which has uh, the fluorescent material. Therefore, this is a simple contour of your uh, uh, CRT tube this is your cathode uh, uh, ray gun uh, through which you can actually using a deflection system you can move this uh, electron beam up and down therefore, it scans uh, uh, 100,000 times per second in such a fashion that you get a complete uh, continuous display uh, of your image. And in this place the anode is actually bearing your uh, phosphor coated screen. So, anode is nothing but a graphite coating and on the graphite coating you can um, you, uh, you can pattern this phosphorus. 
So, th this is where the phosphorus lie and uh, to the present generation uh, this may be a old time photograph because uh, this sort of monitors existed in the early 80s and uh, these are called uh, monochrome displays. Today nobody has seen or it is, it is redundant nobody uh, knows uh, uh, about a monochrome display, but uh, these displays were the first generation uh, displays um, when the computer came into picture in Indian market and as you would see here uh, we all have lived with uh, just a monochrome display for at least 5 years and then the technology transcended to full color display. So, we will see those events more carefully. So, when we look at uh, cathode ray tube this is how the simple operation is electron gun actually brings out a cathode ray uh, which is channelized through an anode. So, the direction is along this way when it uh, goes through this you can actually deflect with a magnetic field and uh, based on the deflection you can try to scan this electron beam or bend this electron beam wherever you want. So, the cathode ray can actually hit the screen um, million times in a second as per the uh, way the deflection is uh, contoured. Now, we can do one more thing we can have a supplement guide in front of the phosphor screen and in that case you will be able to even channelize uh, through this supplement guide which has lot of holes you can channelize how this electron beam can selectively hit some of the phosphor material on the screen. So, this supplement guide is also called a shadow mask and uh, if you have this shadow mask in front of the phosphor screen then that means you are talking about a color monitor system, but if it is a monochrome material you do not need this supplement screen uh, or a supplemental guide or, um, or the shadow mask. So, we will see how the shadow marks uh, will work and uh, in case you have a shadow mask like this which is in the grey uh, image then uh, in a typical CRT color monitor you would not use just one gun, but you would use three guns and each one of this gun is maintained at a different potential to excite the corresponding color. So, the colors are actually made like triads if you can follow here I can draw a triad like this at any point a, any given place. So, each triad forms a pair and each of this triad can actually be be injected with a appropriate cathode ray uh, which has a different energy and depending on that the mixing of these colors occurs. So, if you want more of red color dominance then you need to pump in more cathode uh, ray energy so that you get this on a bright, brighter proportion compared to blue and green. So, in a color monitor you actually have three electron guns doing the job and each of this gun will go through one single orifice in the shadow mask which will in turn uh, do the color uh, right color mixing. So, when all these three hit at three different colors then the actual color mixing will happen and uh, in a typical TV screen you would see this sort of a panel and each one is separated by few angstrom thickness. So, uh, in essence you would actually see a triad of this sort because this will be finally, chipped into micro uh, pixels. So, each pixel would have uh, a combination of triad. So, this is how um, the phosphor coating is actually made on the uh, glass el electrode. And the color mixing as you know the principal three colors are here and these colors when they are mixed in equal proportion then you get uh, white and this white is a combination of uh, 30 percent of green, 33 percent of blue, 33 percent of red. So, actually there is a way to address to this color mixing or to the color purity. So, those in the CRT trade never try to talk about um, phosphor in terms of red, blue and green, but they have coded it such a way 
uh, they know what is what is the color priority or what is the dominant color that will emerge out of a particular phosphor. So, uh, the the color coordinate that is recommended for pure white is 0 0.33, 0 0.33 which is actually defined by a CAE diagram. This is an international standard, this is an international standard it is called CAE XY diagram. So, you can actually plot the, um, the components of blue, red and green in terms of a two dimensional plot and by this way uh, your X axis value and your y axis value will tell you where exactly you stand. For example, the one which we spoke about white should necessarily come here. So, this is your white emission and uh, if, if the um, coordinate is somewhere here, then you talk more about a red dominant one. If your co x y coordinate is somewhere here, then you talk about green or bluish green and so on. So, this is a very useful um, parameter to evaluate what sort of a phosphor you make. So, whenever you make a phosphor and you see there is a potential then necessarily you need to talk about CAE coordinates then the color purity is actually defined. Typically uh, these oxides are colorless those which are used are colorless um, in ordinary light, but in the presence of UV radiation you would see that they are glowing and in cathode luminescence actually this will become much more brighter therefore, it will give a dominant green blue and red and uh, what are the phosphors that are used for cathode ray uh, tube application uh, to single out some example which are as of now used in uh, CRT applications as I told you yttrium oxide uh, or yttrium oxysulfide with europium doping is supposed to be the most preferred one for red. In fact, um, yttrium oxide with europium also gives the same 625 nan nanometer emission, but a, a proportion of sulfur into oxygen is always recommended because it improves on the sharpness and it restricts the degradation. Therefore, uh, yttrium oxysulfide is preferred and as you would see here the other group which is really uh, taken the show in CRT application is zinc sulfide. The base material or the host is the same zinc sulfide, but if you actually dope it with the choice quantity of copper and aluminum these are actually doped less than 5 percent and if you make the right proportion then you get green for copper, but if you dope it with uh, silver then you get a clear blue uh, emission. So, uh, in the whole uh, issue of CRT phosphorus as you would see in the further slides numbers a number of uh, examples are given many compounds have been traded uh, commercially and uh, the most important phosphor of all is the zinc sulphide based one because zinc sulphide phosphor is actually able to take care of both blue as well as green uh, emission. The red is always unique to yttrium oxysulphide. Um, so, uh, for improved contrast we have pigmented variations that are available I will come to this in uh, one of the slides and then particle size and color coordinate variations are available to meet individual customer specification. As I told you in one of the earlier sl slide I talked about the strands of red green and blue phosphorus which are actually coated on the front panel. Therefore, uh, if you want to make such sleek and very narrow uh, width of this phosphor stripes then the particle size of the starting material is important because you need to make a blend and then you need to burn it carefully to make such very sharp um, strands of phosphorus. Therefore, particle size becomes a very unique issue uh, and uh, it is preferred by different uh, customers uh, who have different technology to dope this um, uh, phosphorus on the glass light. Um, as uh, 
as you see in this slide again uh, the whole thing is given and one of the unique stuff that we see in this uh, CRT um, phosphors is that they are coded with specific numbers. Okay. So, uh, depending on the numbers it is possible for us to categorize what sort of compound is used uh, for that particular application. As you would see here in all this uh, blue emitting phosphors it is uh, silver, <coughs> but along with silver you also see a chlorine uh, chloride ion that is doped which is actually considered to be a coactivator. So, if you want a very strong fluorescence not only you dope with silver which is the actual dopant and the actual activator you also use chloride as a coactivator which improves on the efficiency of this compounds. Green ones are those with the copper and the aluminum and again we have uh, yttrium uh, and in all these uh, classes you also see the there is a tag attached to it pigmented and non pigmented because pigmented brings a different effect uh, in terms of the contrast of this phosphorus. One thing is the bright glow that is luminescence, another thing is the contrast, contrast is actually inversely uh, related to um, luminescence. Therefore, we need to have a very sharp control on the contrast also, it is not just a stray uh, light that is coming out, but it has to be very sharp. Therefore, uh, when we talk about contrast the issue of pigmentation comes into picture, I will show uh, some examples on those lines. And uh, in this uh, view graph it may, may not be very easy for you to read through all the numbers, but uh, I am just picking out this column for discussion in the slide. As you would see here these are all the candidates used over the years for cathodroid tubes and uh, for those who are engineering this CRT monitors they usually are very sensitive to the choice of the particle size of this uh, phosphorus. So, if we, if, if we are going to make using a chemical route or by some other route it is not just important to get the emission peak which is desired for example, 525 you would anyway get when you dope manganese in zinc silicate. But you need to achieve the right micron size and it has to be a narrow distribution. If it is a narrow distribution then such phosphor particles can be easily engineered for making this panels. Suppose you have a very wide distribution then it is very very difficult for putting that as a strand in the uh, in the front panel. Therefore, one of the thing that I, uh, I want to point out to you is the average size that is preferred is actually 8 micron. Uh, because we are living in a nano world uh, there is always a temptation for us to talk about nanometer, but one should also realize that the micron technology is proven and it cannot be shaken that easily. Therefore, when you talk about CRT we are not the issue is not about nano size, but the issue is about a very narrow distribution and what is good for processing is a average micron uh, range of 8 micron. So, if you have a 8 micron particle you do not have to really feel bad, uh, but you can only be, ha be happy because that is what exactly is preferred for uh, uh, developing the front panel. And you also see here on the left slide I just want to pick out on um, a few things for example, um, a phosphor uh, which is highlighted in uh, white these are the candidates for getting white light phosphors. And what are these candidates those are a mixture of zinc sulphide doped with silver and zinc cadmium sulphide doped with copper such combinations actually give you white light phosphors. So, you can go for that because if you are looking for applications in liquid crystal displays as a backlight emission then you would rather prefer a white light rather than uh, red, red green or uh, blue. 
and uh, therefore, there are other combinations for example, if you take yttrium oxysulfide which is doped with terbium uh, from 2 to 5 percent then you would end up with white light which has a dominant emission at 545. So, by varying the dopant concentration it is possible for us to engineer a variety of uh, uh, phosphors and as you would see here the range is mainly between zinc sulfide or yttrium based oxides or aluminates. In, in this case for example, this is uh, yttrium aluminum garnet uh, doped with terbium then you should be able to get a 544 nanometer green emission and uh, we can also gamble with uh, several other substitutions um, uh, in case of zinc sulfide based compounds. Uh, there is one compound which is uh, quite peculiar in this table that is gadolinium oxysulfide doped with terbium again shows a 545 nanometer emission and just want to make a correlation between this and this. In this case uh, this is a YAG compound that is yttrium aluminum garnet whereas, in this case this is only simply a gadolinium oxide, but both are giving same emission at 545 nanometer and the peculiarity is because of the dopant which is the same uh, that is terbium 3 plus. So, as you would see it is not the host that would uh, control the light emission, but the dopant because of the particular excitations in the D to F transition or F to D transition which will determine whether um, this is unique of the dopant or not. And as you would see from the red emission it is always europium which gives you emission at 620 nanometers. So, uh, this is the range of compounds that we have. Now, the applications for these materials include CRTs which is uh, the major player in the displays and then uh, in the last 10 years several uh, groups have come uh, uh, or several applications have emerged. One is FED that is field emission displays which are known for uh, the contrast that it can bring in the image resolution or plasma display panels which has revolutionized uh, today's modern living room um, because you do not need a space it can be wall mounted therefore, plasma display panels are really replacing the conventional CRT tubes, but for a higher cost uh, the processing of plasma display panel is three times more costlier than a cathode ray tube, but for uh, from the aesthetic point of view and for making a large panel display uh, still uh, plasma display panels are counted to be one of the modern technologies. And then of course, these same phosphors can be used in vacuum fluorescent displays, fluorescent lamps then x-ray screens and uh, storage plates for medical images and radiography and uh, off late it is also used as uh, tagants uh, in several documentation events I will show one or two examples on that and uh, for immunological assay it can be tagged with uh, organic molecules and of course, uh, the issue of phosphorescence is used now in every bit of application including toys and other safety devices. So, as you would see the, the range of compounds it is not limited and several uh, possibilities are there, but chief among them is the um, application to CRT tubes. Uh, now, in the CRT tube how do we make it as you would see from the uh, cartoon that is given below the, the uh, CRT tube is actually mounted on the top down. Uh, position and you can see the evaporation process is actually happening this way. So, it is a very involved technology and to make one CRT tube it takes several hours uh, starting from the simple glass panel to making the phosphor and then to bring in all the electronic component it takes more than 10 hours to bring out one picture tube. So, it is a very involved issue and as you would see here the way you try to bring about this uh, triad coating is the speciality of the CRT tube. So, if you if you can make the right choice and you if you can make the right approach to coat this material then the color 
purity and the clarity of the pictures will be uh, extremely impressive as far as the CRT tube is concerned and other coatings can also be made using this sort of vacuum technology setup and therefore, this also brings in another issue that you cannot go for a very large area. So, CRT tubes are confined only maximum to 24, 9, 29 inch or 32 inch monitors and bigger than that it is very, very difficult. Therefore, people are trying to uh, transcend from a CRT application to plasma display panel because the way that is operating the principle behind plasma display is very different from CRT and uh, to manage this uh, uh, deflection of cathode rays uh, in, a, in a very focused way it is very important as a result uh, the CRT application is actually confined to a uh, small area display. Uh, this is how the uh, uh, current induced uh, photoluminescence occurs. Uh, in a typical uh, uh, phosphor where uh, depending on the uh, dopant and co-dopant you can actually get the light output uh, from uh, from the dis displays and uh, the spectra from the phosphors actually look like this. The silver doped ones show a blue light here and uh, the copper doped ones show uh, bluish to bluish green. So, um, these two candidates uh, give the blue and green component and as you see here yttrium uh, oxide uh, phosphorus doped with europium usually give a very very strong uh, red light and uh, if you look at the full width at half maxima it is only ranging to two nan less than 2 nanometers which shows how selective this luminescence can be compared to the other two phosphors and this is mainly because of the mechanism of photoluminescence that is operating in the zinc oxide based um, phosphors compared to yttrium based phosphors. And if we are looking for full color display then what we desire is that it should not be narrow, but it should also have a wide mixing uh, between the corresponding colors. For example, blue should nicely mix with the green component in this fashion. So, that the overlap is more, more the overlap then you can try to get the white light emission or the full color display in a better way. Therefore, not just getting a narrow uh, band uh, emission, but mixing of these colors to get the full spectrum is very important. Therefore, the amount of dopant and co-dopant that you add becomes very, very important. And uh, uh, lastly uh, on the mechanism of how this zinc sulphide based phosphorus operate there are two three things that can be dominant one is the electrons are excited to from state 1 to state 2 that is the conduction band and this can uh, this can dwell in the conduction band for a um, short span and then this can give out green emission and come back to the copper ground state level and then this can return back to the ground state. So, this is one process there are other things that are also accompanied with it because of several processing issues. One is if it is a defect induced one then the electron gets trapped momentarily in this trap level and because of the uh, because of the influence of the cathode ray they do get ejected out and finally, they return giving a green emission. So, there are trap levels and the number of trap densities or trap uh, levels do control the quantum efficiency and uh, the purity to some extent. Uh, if we have very little amount of uh, iron that is coming out as an impurity then this can actually act like a killer. So, this is called a killer level because any other impurities which are in same comparable atomic uh, level can actually bring about quenching of this light. In the case of uh, emission that is happening uh, in the red light uh, based on europium oxide based phosphorus, there is a unique issue that is involved. The europium 3 plus can actually go into two different sites in yttria. One is there is nearly 70 percent of sites have C 2 symmetry and then 30 percent of sites have C 3 I symmetry. 
Therefore, the europium which is actually doped in uh, yttria can either go to C 3 I site or it can go to C 2 site. Now, if because there is a inversion symmetry all the European ions which are occupying the C 3 I site actually do not contribute to fluorescence. So, only if they occupy the C 2 sites then they are more productive in terms of emission and therefore, this has to be carefully monitored that the occupancy of the europium site is dominated by a C 2 based occupancy and in fact, it is possible even to reconvert the C 3 occupied sites to C 2 and the conversion that is possible is up to 85 percent um, to C 2 symmetry and those C 2 uh, occupied europium sites actually are responsible for uh, the red emission. This same phosphorus can also be used for plasma display panels and as you would see the display uh, mechanism is quite different compared to the CRT applications and in this case what you see is a plasma discharge and this uh, plas uh, plasma discharge is actually brought about by the UV light and once UV light is generated in the back panel that UV light will shine on the respective ones red, green and blue and as a result you will get uh, a plasma which is generated that will account for the emission of uh, full color display. So, uh, even in this case the way the uh, red, green and blue are mapped is of this fashion as a uh, sub, uh, sub pixel and uh, this will constitute one plasma cell. Therefore, the, uh, the plasma that is generated will have to have uh, a different mixing coefficient between each of this uh, uh, panel and as a result you will get the proper color output. So, in plas uh, plasma display panel the main mechanism is not the cathode ray tube. Uh, or the cathode rays uh, it is the uh, UV light emission which will bring about the uh, color display. So, he, here again you have choice materials which are used for plasma display and uh, we have a set of such uh, phosphors which have been proven and as you know that uh, continuous exposure to UV can also result in degradation of this phosphors or the phosphors can get uh, choked. Uh, and uh, as a result a nice display of this sort can become as um, uh, disfigured like this. So, a distorted display like this clearly shows that the phosphors are getting degraded in the plasma display panel. So, this is one of the main problem that you encounter in uh, practical application uh, compared to CRT tube you have a problem of uh, the phosphor degradation because of a continuous exposure to plasma. So, this has to be um, taken care. Some of the candidates uh, for uh, uh, plasma pan display panels uh, are borates, uh, aluminates, silicates. Uh, this is slightly different from the phosphors that are used in CRT tubes. Main reason is um, the silicates and aluminates are preferred over the conventional zinc sulphide base phosphorus is mainly because of the thermal properties. They are much more rugged for uh, very high heating effect which can happen in the plasma. Therefore, to withstand the internal heating effects we actually use a high temperature uh, ceramics which also have same uh, color efficiency. Therefore, uh, most of these oxides if you see they are all um, uh, insulating or uh, these are uh, uh, high temperature materials. Uh, so, uh, this is very unique for uh, PDP applications and uh, when we come to uh, fluorescent lamps uh, you again see that the major contributor is cerium doping because cerium doped phosphorus they respond immediately to mercury plasma that is generated in all the fluorescent tubes. So, it has to respond and cerium is very unique for uh, green emission you also have magnesium tungstate and uh, then uh, of course, europium 
based yttria these are used for blue and uh, uh, red. The fluorescent color of a sign tube is a combination of emission from phosphor and the discharge that is taking place. So, if it is a mercury discharge then the emission will be mostly dominantly blue in color. Suppose it is a neon discharge uh, alone emits red and adds red in combination with phosphorus for example, uh, green emission color is uh, is gold with the neon. So, if you have a neon discharge then you can get a different um, emission for the same phosphor uh, compared to mercury discharge. Therefore, uh, these are being worked out as combinations for uh, mixing and uh, now when I talk about the contrast of a TV screen we should understand the contrast is nothing but the luminescence contrast performance uh, this is uh, defined as a ratio of your luminescence versus diffuse reflectance. Diffuse reflectance is actually coming from the stray radiation to improve the contrast of a TV screen not only the phosphor brightness is important it just because it glows bright does not make it a good candidate and because we need to combat with the uh, daylight reflectivity of the screen. So, uh, the contrast is actually a gamble between the brightness of the phosphor and the daylight uh, reflectivity and as a result it is generally um, agreed that uh, this has to be pigmented so that the daylight reflectivity can be controlled when the phosphors are glowing and in order to reduce the reflectivity of the white phosphor powders for example, these are all candidates for white phosphor uh, each uh, phosphor particle is covered with a pigment. Uh, for example, uh, cobalt aluminate is a um, good pigment for blue emitting zinc sulphide which is doped with silver and aluminum. Similarly, you can use iron oxide it could be uh, alpha iron oxide powder which is actually used to control the, uh, the reflectivity as far as the red emitting uh, yttria compounds are concerned. So, each of this phosphorus have to be controlled in order to combat with the daylight reflectivity as a result we have uh, a new generation called pigmented phosphorus which are used and this again depends on uh, the, the company which is making and the requirements. So, uh, pigmented phosphorus are a very important uh, issue and uh, here again the pigmentation as you see comes from several colored inorganic uh, oxides. Uh, for example, cobalt aluminate is mostly a peacock uh, greenish blue um, combination, iron oxide is predominantly a yellow brown stuff which is added to control the uh, reflectivity. The pigment particles have to be quite small in size because they should not be of a comparable size with the uh, stuff otherwise the adhesion between the actual phosphor and the uh, pigment will not be say, uh, will become equal as a result um, the narrow range that is preferred for pigmented for uh, particles is of the order of 80 to 120 nanometer. In addition uh, to other ingredients like inorganic oxides you also have organic polymers which can uh, with a good adhesion which can actually coat this uh, um, phosphorus for getting more contrast. Another uh, example of this phosphorus are up conversion phosphorus. As we know when we try to use a UV light then you will get a emission of a higher wavelength in other words a lesser energy. This is actually the uh, Stokes law or Stokes lines which we, which we have uh, learnt uh, from the uh, spectroscopy, but up conversion phosphors are actually anti Stokes phosphors because they take energy in the lower uh, lower nanometer range, but they actually uh, emit a higher energy uh, emission and th therefore, these up conversion phosphors are also called as anti Stokes phosphors this up conversion phosphors are actually used as a anti counterfeit phosphor and it is a luminescent material that converts different invisible infrared, uh, infrared light into visible light. The best example is uh, when we try to 
go through a security zone usually our uh, identity cards are uh, scanned through some uh, light and those are usually infrared lights because that is safer and uh, as you would see here um, in the normal light a tag like this a monogram might have two different lights. So, a person who is trying to dupe may try to put a counterfeit like this, but in the infrared actually it has to glow fully same. So, these are special phosphors which will actually take low energy, but will emit in higher energy. So, this is nearly green which is actually emitting in blue and these are actually called as two photon process or uh, more than two photon process. So, what happens you have a activator which actually takes it to this level and there is another co-activator which will push it to this level. Therefore, the emission will actually be a two photon emission against one photon that you are giving. So, this is a called up conversion phosphors since stable anti stoke phosphors are not generally available and are difficult to manufacture they are actually attractive candidates for uh, security applications. One or two examples of that yttrium fluoride and then sodium lanthanum tungstate these are very critical to prepare uh, people who want to dupe cannot easily make it therefore, these are special chemicals which have a controlled emission and these are also called as anti stokes phosphors. In all normal fluorescence we know that this is uh, behaves uh, based on stokes law however, in anti stoke phosphor uh, we have two or three photon absorption and they emit a single photon of visible light. This is uh, another example of how the uh, IR excited uh, uh, phosphorus uh, behave. You can see here this is the yttrium uh, ytterbium dopant which actually takes care of the emission from uh, this state 2 f 7 by 2 state to 2 f 5 by 2 state, but then you also have a co-doping in the form of erbium which will actually translate this further to higher energy levels as a result the emission that we see here from f 4 9 by 2 to 4 i 15 by 2 is nothing but your red light emission and this is actually engineered by the doping of both ytterbium and erbium as activator and co-activator. And uh, there are also other examples of up conversion not necessarily um, the examples that I showed there. Here you are actually using a combination of gallium uh, arsenide uh, based semiconductors and in combination with this phosphorus they can actually do a up conversion. And as you see here this is your gallium uh, uh, arsenide uh, based uh, panels and here you can put your uh, phosphor and uh, then you can get through suitable uh, filters either red, green or blue uh, colors, but uh, in this set of uh, conversions you would see the phosphors that are used has a much uh, better gamut of color. For example, the triangle that we see on the outer uh, side this is corresponding to the up converters what has been engineered here. So, they have a much better gamut of colors compared to OLEDs which are highly pure, but at the same time they have a very limited color resource and then comes your NTSE uh, based uh, phosphors which are in the middle. So, um, so when you think of uh, several uh, hybrid combinations uh, you, you see this up conversion phosphors seem to have a larger scope than the conventional ones. We can also work out for up conversion phosphors using simple lanthanum oxide which is doped with erbium and ytterbium. You can see the color purity that you can get out of uh, such substitutions and uh, we can also look for uh, red emitting cerium based phosphors which are reported and uh, the color emission in each case will differ depending on this side symmetry. For example, in a cubic crystal field you will get for the same doping a blue color, but in a distort uh, in a distorted cu uh, cubic lattice you will expect a red light and uh, uh, suppose you are going to add with the nitrogen replacing oxygen atoms then you can 
modify the color emission to uh, green. So, such substitutions are also possible. And lastly, I would like to leave with one more thought that uh, LCD whenever we handle LCD laptop uh, computers which we normally use the color emission or the bright color that comes out is actually because of the phosphors and uh, you have a very sleek uh, fluorescent lamp like this and uh, this uh, pencil is kept there for comparison. So, it is as small as that and this can bring out the white light emission that is needed for LCD displays. So, apart from the liquid crystal uh, panel that you have the background emission is actually um, moderated by, uh, by this uh, phosphors which are uh, coated in this uh, uh, tube uh, fluorescent tube. So, um, the range of applications of this phosphors are not limited only to CRT, but to a variety of other display materials and as you would see uh, it is just a simple doping in a host matrix which brings about all these fascinations. So, here the chemistry becomes very important chemistry in terms of the choice of dopant and the chemistry of uh, up conversion comes into picture then the chemistry of controlling the size comes into picture the chemistry of pigmentation to improve the contrast comes into picture therefore, there is plenty of uh, chemistry principles that are involved in this technology which we need to bear in mind therefore, a useful chemist, a chemist who understands all these uh, ideas uh, can successfully produce and engineer a variety of new phosphors uh, for future applications.